Good morning. I'm Jim Spickard, Professor of Sociology at the University of Redlands in Southern California. I'm going to be talking with you this morning about how to design social research to carry out your projects. I'd hope to be able to be with you in person for this conference, but a combination of family health issues and the fact of the very large time difference between where the conference is being held and where I live makes it necessary for me to give the lecture over video. If everything works out well, then this afternoon, your time, I will be able to have a session of question and answers to fill you in on certain things that you might want to know more about what I talk. But for right now, I'm going to give you an overview. And let's go ahead and begin. This lecture provides an introduction to social science research. I've been teaching that topic for years and have developed a relatively easy system for empirically finding out what is going on in the real world. I want to introduce that system to you. And I elaborated in great detail in the book, Research Basics, which came out in 2017 from Sage Publications. This lecture is an overview. The book has both more details and many, many more examples of various kinds of research. I'm a sociologist of religion, and so for the purposes of this lecture, most of my examples will be from research on religions. But the system works as well for other topics. In this lecture, I'm going to cover two of three issues with which any research project has to deal. The first one is why investigate real life. Not all projects need to do this, so you'd better figure out in advance whether you really need to investigate what goes on in the real world or whether your project is one that doesn't need to engage with empirical reality. The second one is how do you design your investigation? We'll spend most of our time today on this particular element. The third topic uh, has to do with the details of how you put your research design into practice. I'll leave that one for later. I will start with an example from my own work. The project I'm going to describe is what's called the Spiritually Vital Episcopal Congregations Project. And it came through a research outfit in the eastern part of the United States, which does research on various congregations. They had a client who wanted to find out, for various reasons, what makes an Episcopal congregation spiritually vital. Spiritual vitality is something that many people who run religious groups would like their group to have. Um, and in this case, the, uh, the client had a certain amount of money to be able to spend on this particular question. And the researchers, who were very, very uh, wise sociologists, said, well, that's great. What do you mean by spiritually vitality? Because how do you know how you're going to find how to find something unless you know what you're looking for? And you can't find out what makes the Episcopal congregation spiritually vital unless you know spiritual vitality when you see it. Well, the client said, you know, we don't really know what we mean by spiritual vitality. We would kind of like you to find that out for us. So the uh, uh, kind of the, the team decided that they would do a survey of bishops in the Episcopal Church, set out a, a questionnaire to all of the bishops, asking them to nominate a, uh, some spiritually vital congregations. And they got something like 250 uh, nominations back. And then they sent out a questionnaire to all of those nominees to, to asking them to describe their congregation and asking them if they would be willing to have a site visitor come and interview people and so on. Well, they got the got material back, they took a look at it, and they divided it into piles of congregations that seemed to be like each other, and they ended up with 13 of these. And the question they decided to pursue was, to what do parishioners and congregational staff attribute their congregation's spiritual vitality? Notice that that question doesn't define spiritual vitality from the outside, 
but it asks people whose congregations have been nominated as spiritually vital to define it for themselves and asks what they find meaningful in it. That is a research question. And the research question is absolutely key to doing any particular project. The research question, among other things, tells us um, what we're looking for. In this case, it tells us that we are looking, we are doing a descriptive study because we want to know what parishioners and staff say about spiritual vitality. That we're not looking for a causal study, you know, X causes Y, because we don't know what spiritual vitality is at this point. So we're asking people to tell us what they think about it, and we're going to describe that. That's the logic of this particular study. It's also an interview study because we're going and talking to people about their views. And so we are taking them seriously as observers of their own congregational life. Now that is, at this point, they got the data back, they have the surveys back, and they sent 13 field workers, of which I was one, to study 13 different congregations which appeared to have all be spiritually vital, but may perhaps in different ways. Well, I studied Reconciliation Parish in San Antonio, Texas. And these are the things that the parishioners told me about their spiritual vitality. First, almost everyone mentioned the architecture of the building, not just because it's a beautiful building, but because for them, the architecture was symbolic of the congregation's attitude toward the world. This is the communion rail, and notice everyone is facing across the communion rail to each other. They see themselves as a group of equals, and they see themselves as a community celebrating Mass together. Secondly, notice all of the windows, and it's circular, and there are windows all the way around. And for them, it means they're not just focused on themselves, they're looking out at the world and the world is looking in, a, in, a, in at them, and they are open to their surroundings. So architecture was one of the things that they thought was when spiritual vitality meant that for them. Community was deeply important, and this congregation had many, many community activities, including people of all ages and all skills. Liturgy was important, uh, and the number of different liturgies, the amount of liturgical work in this congregation was truly stunning. Study and contemplation were important, and they had adult education classes on things like Celtic spirituality, women's spirituality, spirituality of the Desert Fathers, and so on and so on. And many people talked about this as a reason why they had been nominated. Well, all of the field workers went out and they all found different things. And what they found was that the other congregation in the study had different views about what made them spiritually vital. Some saw that their, aid, their continued aid to the poor as a center of congregation life that made them vital. Some saw their social activism. So for some, it was a Pentecostal-like enthusiasm that made worship particularly vital, some it was music, some it was good preaching, several different answers. And in short, there was no formula that we found in this study for producing spiritual vitality. Now, this is an interesting thing. We investigate real life in order to find out how it works. And what we discovered here is that there isn't just one thing that Episcopalians regard as spiritually vital. If we hadn't gone out and looked for this, I mean, we were all surprised by this. We hadn't gone out and looked for this. We would not have found that. That's one of the reasons for investigating real life. I won't go into any more detail at this point, but I do want to note some assumptions that we're making anytime we go out into the real world and do investigations. First, we have to presume that there's a real world there. This is an epistemological question. Is there something out there that's real that we can investigate? We have to assume that we as human beings are capable of finding out about it. And then further, we have to decide that finding out about 
what's going on empirically is worth doing. These are all important epistemological issues, but research doesn't start with those. We don't start by deciding the, the epistemology. We start by figuring out how to find out what is going on in the world, and we assume that something we find out will be worthwhile. That's the first of the three issues that I wanted to raise. Don't spend a lot of time on it, but I want to spend more time on this second one, which is once you've decided you're going to go out in the real world for your project and find out something there, how do you plan your investigation? And that will begin now. Research is not terribly difficult, so long as you think through the process before you begin. I've identified six basic steps in the research process, starting with the question of what is it you want to know? If you work your way through this, the, these six steps, your research will be well designed and it will flow easily. If you don't work your way through it, and if you don't think about the interrelationship between the steps and so on, believe me, you will have a good deal more trouble. So, as I say, the first the issue is the research question, what is it you want to know? We saw an example just a moment ago of a client coming to a research outfit with a question that they knew what they wanted to know, but that wasn't really a researchable question. And it was only the second question that the research outfit came up with that was actually investigable and ended up driving the investigation. So you may discover you want to know something that you can't possibly find out, you know, um, or you may find that you need to ask something else. But at any rate, that's where you begin. What do you want to know? And a clue to what you want to know and how you want to structure research is what do you want to do with that knowledge? Let's say in some cases, you're interested in simply describing how other people see the world or describing what the life of a congregation is like or describing um, uh, sets of what sets of relationships that people have in a uh, city or a village or whatever it happens to be. Those are one kind of logical structure, a descriptive logical structure. And on the other hand, other research often wants to do causal research. It wants to make causal connections between things. If you have A, then you will always have B. Those are Per both perfectly fine logical structures, but they are different logical structures. And your job is to identify which one of these structures is yours. And we're gonna start with these two in a moment. But the key to the whole system, and we're gonna spend more time with this, is what type of data do you need to, need to find in order to answer your research question? If you're answering a question, for example, I, I wanna answer a question about what individuals or people in a particular location and so on think about a deep and complex issue, you're going to need to gather deep and complex data from them. You're not going to go in and try to have them check off boxes, you know, A, B, and C, because that's not going to get you the kind of information you need. On the other hand, if you're going into a situation and you just want to find out how many people are there of type A, type B, category C, et cetera, and how many men, women, how many, whatever, whatever the categories are, then it's pretty easy to go in and have people check a box or to go in and count or whatever it is. Those are different types of data, and I will show you 14 different types of data that, that matter. Each one of those types of data has a different data collection method. And that's why the type of data is so important. If you can identify what type of data you want, that will tell you one or sometimes several ways to collect that data. And that makes your research a whole lot easier. Number five is the data collection site where you're going to find that data. Uh, this is usually the easiest part, um, unless you end up with a very complex uh, type of data. But um, that collection site is wherever you can find the data and can get a hold of it. And then the last question is, how will you analyze that data? That is, are you going to use 
qualitative data analysis or quantitative data analysis, and which variety of those are you going to are you going to use? The interesting thing is there are many people say, oh, I want to do a piece of quantitative research. Well, that's nice, but what are you looking for? Does the research, can you, what type of data, uh, what type of data analysis will answer your research question? And that's the only key. So the point is you get these six steps, tie them together, make them all fit in your design process before you ever go into the field and do any, any, any uh, uh, study and you end up with clear results. Well, let's take a look at step one, the issue of a research question. We need to distinguish here between a research topic and a research question. Um, let's imagine that you wanna, taking the example I gave earlier, study spiritually vital congregations. And let's imagine that you can figure out a definition of spiritually vital that you want to use. Uh, you know, it's that's a topic though, because it doesn't tell you what you want to know about them. Now you can say, okay, well, I want to break that down. I want to narrow it a little bit. I want to do spiritually vital Episcopal congregations. Well, that's nice, but you still don't know what you want to know about that congregation yet. Maybe you've defined spiritual vitality as socially active. Well, that's fine too, but still, what is it you actually want to know about the process? Now, the clients in that study that I mentioned earlier came with a question, what makes an Episcopal congregation spiritually vital? And if you look at this question, you see two things. One's the problem I brought about at first. They didn't know what spiritually vital meant, and neither did the folks they were hiring to do the research. But also, this is a causal question. It says, we want to end up with spiritual vitality, although we don't know what that means. So what can organizationally can we do to cause that? That's fine. It wasn't the, the failure of this question was that we didn't, couldn't identify what spiritually vital meant. The revised question, what to what do parishioners attribute their congregation's spiritual vitality is a different kind of question. It's not a causal question, but it does give us something that tells us uh, about that congregation and about what people think. And these are the two things we revise because the question isn't a functional question until we can do two things with it. First, the question needs to show us what the logical structure of our research is going to be. And secondly, it needs to show us the type of data that we need to collect. Now, the first, the original there doesn't show us what type of data we need to collect because we don't know what spiritual vitality is. We can't define it. Uh, it does have a logical structure. The second one has both. And the type of data are the local people's views who are experts about their own congregation. To what do they attribute their congregation's spiritual vitality? And the logical structure for the first one is causal, but for the second one, it's descriptive. We're describing what people are telling us. And that makes this a functional question. The process works for whatever your project happens to be. Now, what about logical structures? That issue of what do you want to do with this knowledge? Well, there are, I've got it here on the board, on the, the screen, nine different kinds of logical structure, nine different, different kinds of research that we will, that um, uh, we, can, we can look at, but they fall into three categories. Over on the left side of the screen, you've got true experiments, quasi-experiments, ex post facto research, correlational research, and so on. And these are all looking at relationships between data. A true experiment, um, these, these all ask do questions. Does A relate to B? Now, true experiment, will you by say, all right, I'm going to hold all these things constant. I'm going to vary this one variable, and I'll see if it makes a difference to the result. That's a true experiment. Now, a quasi-experiment is 
when you kind of let nature do that experiment for you. So we're in the middle, middle of a um, COVID pandemic and public health officials in the United States are setting up any of the local areas are setting up different rules for how people are supposed to interact and wear masks and so on and so on. And some of those rules do a pretty good job of keeping COVID under control and other rules don't. And so we have a natural experiment. We can figure out where, which kinds of rules work. We didn't have to set that one up, but the public authorities set it up for us. Ex post facto research involves going back afterwards and doing that same kind of thing. Correlational research says, do things go together even if they don't necessarily cause one another? There's a lot in the book about that and I'm not gonna go into great detail. But relationship questions are really questions about, is there a relationship between two or more different variables. Descriptive research is after descriptions. It answers what questions, what happened in a particular case, and that might be historical research. What do people think about a thing that we're asking for their dis to describe their, their, uh, their, their process? What is the social structure in a particular city neighborhood, village, et cetera. That is, we're describing the patterns of relationships between people. And all of these are questions of what's there, which is very different than a do question. And then we have three that are somewhat different. Long longitudinal research looks at a particular population or situation over time, from time A to time B to time C, et cetera. And it could ask do, or it could ask what. It could be either one of the others. A meta-analysis is a putting together of a whole bunch of other studies to see if you can find results that are confirmed by multiple studies. And action research is a process where we are looking at the question, how? How do we accomplish something? We've got a project. We want to find out whether a particular way of intervening with poverty will help bring people out of poverty or help people live better lives. And so we try it out and we see whether that technique works or not. That's what action research does. And each one of those is a different logical structure. So you have your question, you know what you want to do with the knowledge, that is you have your logical structure. And the third element, the most important element is what kind of, what type of data do you need to answer your research question? This one's a little more complicated, so we're gonna dive in pretty deeply. Here I've set out 14 different types of data. These are different kinds of things that you might encounter, you might want to use to answer your particular research question. And we may need, they fall into categories and we may need to make some distinctions between them because sometimes the differences are subtle and you have to be very precise about what it is you're looking for. So for example, take this top two set of two here. We have acts, behavior, and events. These are things that you can observe or that somebody else can observe. If you observe them or someone in your study team is, or observes them, then we are looking at actual acts, behavior, and events. But if all you have is the reports of somebody that has seen those acts, then we have to filter the acts themselves through the words or the vision of the reporter. And we all know how distorted things can be when they come through somebody else's eyes. So just to use a silly example here, we've got on the left, a picture of a person holding a rifle pointed at somebody else saying, hands up. And that's an act because we're observing it. On the left, right, we have my neighbor pulled a gun on someone last night. That's a report of the same act possibly by the person who's making the statement, possibly by someone that they've heard from. And so we 
have to treat that differently. Some research questions are going to ask you for acts. Some are going to ask you for reports of acts. And the distinction is important to keep in mind. Now, here's a set of three that all go together. They all tend to be large data, data having to do with big organizations and so on. Usually these are things that we're not able to collect ourselves, but we can get pretty easily from various, various uh, groups. Um, and they're a little different. Here you have a graph of the, uh, the red line is productivity per worker over the last um, 50 years in the United States. And productivity per worker has gone up tremendously. But you'll note by the other lines that the actual amount of money going to those workers has not increased at the same rate of, product, rate of productivity. One of the changes that's happened in the United States over the last uh, 40 or 50 years is that people in the working class have not gotten the same share of their productivity gains that have gone to people higher, higher up in the economy. That's an example of organizational data or economic data produces this. Organizational data might involve an organizational chart. This is a chart of the offices in the Department of Energy. And you've got a bureaucracy and you've got people involved with controlling various offices and so on. And any kind of organization is going to have organizational data about its workings that's publicly available. Now there's also the informal way that organizations work, but that's a separate question. We're here looking at formal organizational data. And then the third one is demographic data, world population by regions projected to 2100. Um, this is of course speculative data. We don't have the data yet, but this is projections. It has to do with demographics. So those two are, those three are all somewhat related. Self-identity is a very different thing. It's very simple. How do people identify themselves? You know, someone says, I'm a green, or I'm a red, or I'm male, or I'm female, or whatever it happens to be. It's the identities people take on for themselves, as opposed to the identities that other, others give them. And you can make some very interesting comparisons between those two things. These are very important and they are at the heart of much social science research. Shallow opinions and attitudes are those things that um, are easy. They're, people can, can tell you very quickly what it is they think about something. Deep opinions and attitudes require going in a great deal more depth and I'm gonna treat personal feelings like that as you'll see in a moment. So here we have an example of shallow opinions and attitudes person on the left saying, I think Republicans have really cool ideas about the environment. And in, for those of you who don't know, Republicans are one of the, are the right-wing political party in the United States. The person on the, the, in green is saying, I would never let a racist give a talk in my community. Now that's a shallow opinion. Those questions have been asked on social surveys for the last 50 years. And so we can track the degree to which people think Republicans have good ideas on the environment, or people uh, think that uh, racists should be allowed to give uh, talks in their communities. We can track the percentage of the population that thinks that because the questions are so easy for people to answer. They check a box on a survey. On the other hand, take a moment to read this one. Uh, stop the video if you need to to get a whole, whole sense of it. It's not the kind of thing someone could check on a survey. I've changed my views on that topic a lot. I used to think that all people were pretty much good at heart and I'd still agree with that statement if you asked me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a deep opinion. Here you see someone reflecting on her experience and her, her sister's experience and that's a very complex thing. This requires a very different data gathering technique than you can find 
uh, than is, is necessary for getting uh, shallow opinions. Now, personal feelings work like deep opinions and attitudes, although they happen on the emotional level. I put them differently because they're a somewhat different uh, uh, data type, but they tend to be used the same with data gathering techniques. Now, cultural knowledge and expert knowledge. Cultural knowledge are things that everybody knows in a particular social setting, although people outside that social setting may well not know it. This is what anthropologists spend their time finding. So here is an example of cultural knowledge taken from male culture, American culture, in my particular generation. Look, that's just, just the way we do things. Guys are supposed to solve problems, even if we don't feel particularly competent doing so. And we're not supposed to make a big deal about it. No drama. You see what you've got to do and you do it. That's the rules. I didn't make them, but we all know about them. Now that's cultural knowledge. Everybody knows that's the way things are supposed to be, even if not everybody does things that way. Expert knowledge is different. Expert knowledge is the kinds of things that only experts know and that they're not common knowledge, but experts will tell you about them. The people in the uh, reconciliation parish were experts in the life of their parish, whereas people attending other parishes in San Antonio were not. I'm an expert on research design and you're getting my expertise in the process of this lecture. So I don't need an illustration of that, but you can see how the kinds of things you're gonna be looking for, the kinds of ways you're gonna be getting at these are gonna be somewhat different. Now, these two are more difficult. Personal and psychological traits are the kinds of things that psychologists um, uh, study and they've got uh, all sorts of tests for coming up with psychological traits and so on, and I won't go into detail, but there's a chapter in the book about that. And experience as it presents itself to consciousness is extremely difficult to, uh, to attain, to gather, uh, it requires phenomenological, phenomenological analysis, and I have a chapter on that on the book too. I will simply say, don't try to do a doctoral dissertation that involves that type of data gathering because it will take you too long. And then the last is what we call hidden social patterns. These are the things that the outsiders can often see in a setting better than the insiders can, although the insiders will usually confirm the existence of them once of the patterns and so on. So this is a kinship diagram, the very typical kind of thing that anthropologists do when they try to figure out relationships between people and the kinds of mutual duties that people have in a particular kinship system. And they try to figure out the rules for human behavior. It's a hidden social pattern because it isn't the kind of thing that presents itself immediately to you, but it is a social pattern that you can identify and confirm in a social setting. So those are the 14 different types of data that I treat in the book. Um, the point is you need to figure out what kind of data you're really looking at so that you can identify a data gathering technique. The data types tells you how to collect the data and it also tells you how to analyze it. And we'll get to that in a moment. Step four, choose a data method, uh, choose a data collection method. And here across the top, this is the, on page 69 of the text. It's probably the most valuable single page in the text. It's got uh, across the top, it's got the 14 different kinds of, of uh, data and down the side, it has a number of different data collection methods and the red circles indicate where, what of the data collection methods you can use to produce a particular kind of data. Now, the X's means this is a pretty good way of collecting that data. The X in parentheses means, eh, you can get it that way, but it's not necessarily the best. And so if, for example, 
you are trying to collect uh, people's reports of acts, economic data, demographic data, and so on. You can often get this from public and private records. You can't get acts themselves. You can't get self-identity. There are lots of other things you can't get using that technique, but you can get those. Detached observation is quite good at looking at acts and behavior and at looking at hidden social patterns. It's terrible at looking for if shallow or deep opinions and so on. Ethnography, which is a big fuzzy term that we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about in another lecture, um, is good for observations. It's very good for getting at cultural knowledge and it's good for getting at hidden knowledge. In the process of doing those, it picks up expert knowledge of people in the social field. It picks up people's shallow opinions, their deep opinions, and so on. So there's other things that you can get, but it is stellar for certain elements. And I won't go through the whole chart here, but these are, once you know your type of data, you can just read down that column and pick a data gathering technique that will help you find what you want to find. Let's dive a little bit deeper into this so you get a good idea of how you work from the type of data you want to a data collection method. We're gonna take some examples. First, we'll take a look at shallow opinions. These are those things that people can answer pretty quickly because they've got an already formed opinion or it's a matter of identity or whatever it happens to be. And if you take this column, which I've, so, uh, the column where I've circled the data type in yellow, and you look down that column, you find a bunch of X's in parentheses, but you find one that is a X in without a parentheses, which means that the research gather, data gathering technique mentioned there is excellent for finding that. You look over to the left and you find that they, we've circled surveys and questionnaires. Surveys and questionnaires are a good way to gather shallow uh, uh, opinions, because they are things that people, people can answer those quickly. The answers are clear. It doesn't take them much time to do so. And they don't have to go very deeply. On the other hand, if we want deep opinions, which I've circled in red, we look down that line and we find various ways to sort of get at them. But the one that is perfect is the one across from in-depth interviews. That is, if you're looking for people's deep opinions about things, then the best way of getting there is through the in-depth interviews. Let's take a third. This is cultural knowledge. These are the things that everybody knows in a particular cultural setting. And as you look down the column, you discover that there actually are several of them that uh, where data gathering techniques are quite good at gathering this type, type of data. Ethnography is a pretty good way of doing it, except that ethnographers tend to spend you know, several years in a particular setting. So uh, if you're time pressed for time, that may not be the recommended uh, technique. But ethnographers hang out in a setting for long enough that they can get cultural knowledge and they collect cultural knowledge, the things that everybody knows in that setting. In-depth interviews are a good way to get this, as are surveys and questionnaires, depending on the kind of cultural knowledge that you're looking for. You don't get deep cultural knowledge there, you don't get nuance, but you can get a sense of how broadly things are spread. So the, the, the survey questions are clearly part of it, but also the ethnography and in-depth interviews. But keep going down that column, you'll find a few other techniques. This one is called focus groups. Basically, you get a bunch of people who know something about a topic, you put them in a room together, you ask them questions, and they answer them collectively, they hear each other answering the questions. And this tends to stimulate people's thinking. They will Someone will answer a question and uh, someone else may say, well, that's right, but let me add a little bit to that. And that can be often be a very valuable way of collecting cultural knowledge. And then the last pair is down at the bottom, 
content analysis and discourse analysis. And in both of these situations, you work with texts to see the cultural knowledge that is embedded in particular texts. Now, you remember I made a distinction between cultural knowledge, which everybody knows, and expert knowledge, which only experts in a particular situation uh, know. And I used the example of my research expertise as an example of expert knowledge, but it's only one. There's many, many kinds of expert knowledge. You all have kinds of expert knowledge that I certainly don't have. But once again, look down the column. We see our in-depth interviews. And that's a good way to get expert knowledge because experts tend to talk a long time about the things that they know and you want them to in order to get their expertise. But there are two specific techniques that work pretty well farther down the list. And these are once again, focus groups and you can get a bunch of experts in the room and they'll all talk together. But a particular kind of interview technique is what we call critical incident interviews. And this is where you get an expert, somebody who's experienced something, and you ask them a question about what happened in a particular incident where that shows something about their knowledge. So for example, if you were asking me about how to practice ethnography, you might say, what happens when you can't figure out who's in charge in a particular situation? And can you give me an example of a time of when, when you, that happened? Or can you give me an example of a time when you were confronted with, with the possibility that you might not have access, you might lose your access to the field? And what did you do? And so I tell you a story about that. And the story brings out the nuances in a way that other things may not. So critical incident technique is a very interesting thing to look at particularly for looking for expert knowledge. Now, here's the summary. As I said, this is page 69. It's probably the most valuable page in the book. And it shows you the relationship between data types and data gathering methods. And that's key for designing your research. So where will you collect that data? That is your data collection site. And the short answer is wherever you can find it. And that's not just where it is, but also where you have access because none of us has access to every kind of data that's available. You have to plan. It's not just you know wandering around looking for it, but you must plan. And then the last one is choosing a data analysis method. And there's a simple rule for this one. If you count it, if you have, if it's data that you can count and you want your research question asks you to count it, then you use quantitative analysis. If you describe it, you use qualitative analysis. And each one of those data types has its own preferences among these. This is the last step in your planning because all of the others will, will interact and you may find that when you look at your data collection method or your data collection site, you can't do what you wanted and then you go back and modify your research question and work your way through then. And here you've got the data. The question is, what are you gonna do with it? But you plan it before you get out in the field. So here's a chart also in the book of the data analysis methods and the ones here in red tend to use quantitative analysis. Opinions and attitudes, particularly on surveys, use quantitative analysis. Psychological traits, particularly if you're using a psychological test, they use it. Economic, organizational, demographic data, and so on and so on. Those are all standard for quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis tends to, to go toward deep opinions, personal feelings, expert knowledge, and experience as it presents itself to consciousness, but read the chapter on that before you attempt to dive into that one. And the rest of them can do either they can go both ways. And so you need to figure out what it is you're trying to do. Now I'm gonna say a couple of words about various kinds of analysis here. 
This is a chart that is both in the text and in the back of the text. It is a uh, public domain, which uh, it's a Creative Commons, which means that you can cut it out, Xerox it, use it wherever you want. It describes a way to think your way through the various um, process of, of uh, doing quantitative analysis. You identify your variables, you find the frequencies, you pick additional variables, you compare groups. Down here on the bottom, the, 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 the bottom right where the two stars are, those are different kind of statistical routines that have different requirements. You can find the data elsewhere. Now, on the right here, I've got a different kind of analysis. And this is a screenshot of uh, a program called MaxQDA that will help you do qualitative data analysis. It helps you organize things. Both of these quantitative, quantitative and qualitative analysis, you're, they, they help you find patterns. And it's really patterns that you're after. Some patterns fall or, or exist in numbers. Some patterns exist in themes or uses of discourse or what have you, but all kinds of analysis, that's what they're supposed to accomplish. Well, there you have it. These are the six steps to designing social science research. You ask, what do you want to know? What do you want to do with the knowledge? What type of data do you need? How will you collect that data? Where will you collect the data? how you will analyze that data. And when you put all those together, then you have a very good chance of getting results. Let's take an example briefly. Take as an example, our Spiritually Vital Episcopal Congregations Project. How does that project line out against these six steps? Well, the first one we've already talked about. The research question, when we were finally done, was, to what do parishioners and staff attribute their congregation's spiritual vitality? The logical structure of that study was a descriptive study. It was describing what people had to say. The type of data was deep opinions, because these are the kinds of th are not the kinds of things you can get with a simple survey. You really want to get people talking about their deep impressions of things. The data collection method was therefore in-depth interviews. That's one of the best ways to get people to do that. Data collection site was Reconciliation Parish, in my case, and the other 12 parishes that were part of the study. And the data analysis system was thematic and content analysis. The leaders of the study poured over the transcripts of the interviews and the other data we collected to see what there was, what the, the, those data could tell them to answer the research question. Those are the results. That's where research is supposed to aim us. At this point, I would normally break for asking questions because we've covered a great deal of material and I'm sure you have things you want to ask about. Unfortunately, uh, because of the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, beginning of the lecture, I'm not able to be there in person yet. I expect to be able to be there within some time, uh, within a few hours, um, perhaps later today. And we could have a good question and answer session at that point about anything you don't understand. Thank you for listening. I have some resources for you. There's not only the book, which I believe you have a copy, but I have two web more, uh, sites, two web addresses where you can find more material. The one at the top here is marked workshop slides and materials, and it's a bit.ly address. That's where I have posted the slides for this uh, that you've just seen. The video, uh, so a couple of articles that uh, you'll find interesting and various other things that I've come up with. And there may be more there by the time you actually uh, visit the site. You're welcome to use them. Uh, they're part of the deal. The, Website is my course website for my research design class taught at the University of Redlands. And it's also open to the public. 
and uh, has a lot of material that you can download. You're welcome to use the material from there. It's got a stat book I wrote some years ago that is now um, Creative Commons and can be used by anybody. Um, plus, there are a lot of interesting stuff. So explore that, enjoy, and I hope you've had a good time.